to our first Scholar in Residence series at SBDC. Tony is a professor of architecture and the founding director of the Max Bond Center of Design at City, University, City College in New York. She is also an active private practitioner and she did a lot of work on the Detroit Works Project in 2012 and completed the release of the Detroit Future Cities Comprehensive Plan. Today Tony will be talking to us about her work with Detroit and perhaps some other uh, of, of her interests. She will be with us for the next two days, so if there are any of you who are working on Just City, Equity, Detroit, things such as that, that would like to sit down and talk to her, please feel free to. She will be in room 115 if she's not elsewhere. Uh, and with that, I would like you all to help me welcome Tony. Is this my phone? Can people hear me? Without yelling? <laughs> Great. Um, well, first let me uh, thank uh, the school director and Xenia for this uh, really wonderful invitation. Uh, I didn't know I was the, setting the precedent for the scholar in residence, so you all will be the judge of whether or not you think it's uh, worthwhile and useful. And uh, I'm looking forward to spending the next three days here and getting to know. Uh, I think faculty and students, I think, uh, there are a number of events scheduled where I get to interact with, with everyone, so I look forward to it. Um, anyone here from Detroit? Cool. Uh, Michigan? Chicago? New York City? No East Coasters, great. Notre Dame? That's my alma mater. Um, well, um, I'm, I'm sure, uh, irregardless of where you all are from, uh, but certainly being uh, in Michigan over the last few years, uh, it's probably not often that it goes by where you don't hear something about uh, Detroit and what's going on there. Uh, I had the privilege of being asked by the Kresge Foundation and the city of Detroit uh, to come in and help them look at some of the challenges, many of which they've been facing for a number of years, but more importantly, some of the immediate crisis around their population loss and their excessive amount of uh, vacancy, land vacancy. Uh, and they've been struggling with what to do with that. So what I wanted to share with you this afternoon, and hopefully leave time for questions, um, is uh, that work that we did over the last three years called Detroit Future City. So if we could have the lights down in front of the screen, I think it'll be easier to see. Great, thank you. Okay, so as um, the professor just uh, introduced me, I am the founding director of a design research center located in the Spitzer School of Architecture at the City College of New York, named the J. Max Bond Center on Design for the Just City. And partly why uh, I decided to incorporate Design for the Just City as part of the name is because many of the cities that I've worked on in my career, I started my career out as an architect in Chicago, working for a large firm, Skidmore, Owens & Merrill. Uh, and then moving into the public sector, where I've worked in Washington, D.C., New York City, uh, New York, New Jersey, and recently Detroit. I tended to find, and I said I was from Chicago, I grew up on the south side, um, I tended to find that these kinds of issues were prevalent in every city and just about every problem, whether it was architectural, uh, neighborhood-based, or city-wide, uh, that I had had the privilege to work on over my career. Issues of equity, inclusion, opportunity, justice, and access. Um, I have found in my career that these issues are still unresolved in a, a number of American cities and communities, leaving what I call a context of an unfinished city. And we could argue, and uh, you might actually believe, that a city is never really supposed to be finished, that in fact what makes cities fun and dynamic is that they're always changing. Um, but in this particular case, I find that these urban landscapes where these issues are still unresolved or in conflict or missing, um, is where we still have a lot of work to do. And not only uplifting the places that we're all studying, uh, and hopefully we'll be working with them, but also the people within them. And by this, and, and towards this goal, is what I mean by design for the just city. So part of what my center is going to be doing, 
um, is looking at issues like this and really trying to evaluate whether the role that we play as architects, construction managers, urban planners, landscape architects can really have a fundamental role in shaping what I call urban justice. And so maybe as part of what we talk about after I present the Detroit work, we can talk about you know, what you think about those issues. Let's see what I one. Um, so these are all maps. For some reason, none of my slides is this one. Hold on a second. Oh, there it is. This one will work. OK. Uh, does anyone know if this is a map enough? Detroit? OK. Uh, does anyone know what we're looking at? It is population. Uh, it's the whole city of Detroit. You're looking at what's called a racial composition map. So all the dots that are in red represent white population. All the dots that are in blue represent black population. Uh, there's a little bit of orange representing Hispanic population. And a smidgen of green representing Asian population. Um, because you knew what city that was, it's I think obvious to say that you know the, the shape of the city, right? The city's boundaries. And so that very straight east-west line you see is the infamous eight mile. And what we see in this map is what? Severe racial segregation. Uh, and what we see is a, a very large concentration of African Americans in one part of the region and white population in another. Detroit is 82% African American population. But what this map tells us and what these maps of other cities tell us is that we're still living in fairly racially segregated environments, even though in our everyday and in our classrooms and amongst our friends, we might not feel that we're living in such a segregated environment, but so many of our American cities still exist this way. Can anyone pick out any of the other four maps? Which one? Yep. Yep. Nation's capital. <laughs> Which one? Oh. Yeah. Uh, and so that split you see is um, the Potomac and Rock Creek Park. So it's divided evenly sort of on the east-west axis. Uh, and so so many of these cities are struggling with this kind of dynamic. We also have many cities dealing with this kind of devastation. Uh, we're seeing pictures of this every year now, of communities that have been devastated by natural disaster. This is an image from New York um, post-Hurricane Sandy. Um, and we tend to, as a nation and as practitioners and policymakers, really rise to the occasion and, uh, with a great sense of urgency, uh, with resources and help in trying to figure out not only how to repair uh, what's happened here, but how to prevent it from happening again. There's usually a very rapid response to this kind of natural disaster. What we don't find is a real rapid, urgent response to this kind of disaster, which pretty much looks the same as the one caused by uh, natural uh, events. This one is called by economic devastation. And this happens over a protracted period of time, years and decades. This is a very common landscape within Detroit and other cities that have lost a significant amount of population and building stock. So some facts about Detroit. Uh, at its peak, Detroit was 1.8 million people, and that was around 1950s, when a number of older American communities reached their highest amount of population. And what you're looking at is a series of maps that show how the region grew. So the first map that you see on your left is from 1905, where obviously development was, was really very closely, tightly knitted to the river and grew out from there. In the middle where you see the red triangle is about 1952, and you can see from 1952 the growth is rapid and pervasive throughout the region. Part of what I believe is the challenge and problem of Detroit is caused by this migration known as urban sprawl that results in what we have today, a population that's just over 700,000 people 
these maps showing uh, the growth of Detroit and its boundary. Uh, at its peak in the 1950s, where we see the most red, is when the city is built out to its current geopolitical boundaries. And then the map immediately to the right, you begin to see the gray populating through the red again. And that's representative of the amount of vacancy, both in physical stock, but also building. So we have a city that's lost 60% of its population since its peak. Now, there's a trend of these cities uh, in the U.S., mostly west of uh, the Mississippi, known as legacy cities. A uh, number of my colleagues and I have been framing these cities as cities that are over 50,000 in population, that have lost 20% and sometimes more of their population since their peaks, and their peaks were usually in the 1950s and 1960s. Youngstown, Ohio, St. Louis, Missouri, and Detroit top, top the list, as does New Orleans, but we know that New Orleans uh, population loss was largely caused by natural events. And so we're beginning to do some really interesting mapping to help us understand if there are common trends that not only cause these events to happen, but more importantly, how we look at the unique solutions that may be required to save them since They've been this way in, in a declining state for the last 60 years. Clearly, some of the tools that we've been trying to use perhaps aren't working as effectively as they should, and this is the time for new innovation and new themes. <coughs> so to put uh, a little bit of detail on Detroit's uh, economic uh, disaster, uh, there are 80,000 abandoned homes in Detroit. There's over 100,000 vacant parcels in Detroit. And to give you a sense of scale, you can fit uh, the cities of St. Louis, I'm sorry, San Francisco, Boston, and Manhattan within the footprint of the city. So the city is about 139 square miles total. And these cities, if you uh, map them all to the same scale, fit right within the footprint. So when we take that over 180,000 parcels of vacant and abandoned land, which this map shows, and you can see it's just not all in one part of the city. It's completely indiscriminate, and it's everywhere. There's no nice, neat pattern of how you could just draw a circle around it and try to figure out what to do with it. Every neighborhood in the city feels some effect of this loss. So if we took all that, it equates to about 20 square miles of vacant lands. And if we squish it all together, it's roughly the size of the island of Manhattan. So if you've ever been to Manhattan or studied it, it's a pretty big place, relatively speaking. So imagining that all vacant gives you a sense of just how large this problem is. Now, what's been interesting to me as a part of my work as a practitioner in doing the plan for the city and, and with the community, as well as as a professor um, who teaches around these issues, um, it was important as a, a team that we understood what uh, some of what Detroit's planning history was. And it was really interesting to me. I was actually in a bookstore in Berkeley, and I found this book by Elio Saarinen, uh, who you may know is a famous architect, he and his brother, and they worked and practiced in this very region, in and around Cranbrook. And in the 1930s, he actually produced this book called The City. Now, I had no idea that he produced it, but at this scale, I know him as a very brilliant architect. Um, but in the 30s, uh, folks began to see the trend of the devolving, congested, crowded city and the movement out into the suburbs, away from the older industrial city and out to the proverbial greener pastures. And he began to see the trends of Detroit already, Detroit's neighborhoods already beginning to erode. And so he taught um, design studios, and he had his students do a number of investigations to try to figure out what to do with it. And he came up with this notion of organic decentralization, which if you look at the, the map on the right, is basically the city is going to begin to fragment, and you're going to have these more polycentric places within the city where there's actually going to be strong activity. It's not going to be all contiguous. Now, I think this is kind of interesting that both, one, uh, this trend is happening, uh, or, or the threat of this trend is happening as early as 1930s, 
And you have architects, not just planners, beginning to think about how to spatialize the city. Similarly, we have another uh, famous planner, uh, Hilbersheimer, who's done a lot of work in thinking about Detroit, uh, along with famous architect Mies van der Rohe. He, too, in the 1940s, saw that the technologies of the automobile and railroads was going to lead us to the greener pastures again. And how do we think about a new urbanity away from the congested, old, dirty, smelly city? Uh, and he began to think about these um, new cities aligned around these major transportation hubs where built form was mixed in with green space at a much, much bigger scale. Uh, but he saw that the way in which uh, the automobile industry was leaving the city and the technology that facilitated movement of cars and goods and people was not going to be good for Detroit. And from that time, um, we see a series of plans in Detroit that are really about blight elimination and improvement. The first of which comes by um, the Federal Highways Act from the early 1940s. And Detroit is home to the first depressed freeway in the country. Um, the creation of these freeways in the city obliterate neighborhoods, many of them poor, many of them African American, and it wholesale displaces them, displaces them out into other parts of the city. And so you see these shaded lines on the map to the left, which shows where those neighborhoods were removed. In 1993, we're still talking about blight and deconstruction. At this point, the city is still devolving, uh, losing population, losing built form, and city councilors are actually thinking about closing off and shutting down parts of the city. Now, you may have heard stories about shutting down the city, or certainly the fears that residents have had about shutting down the city for the last couple of years. But what was interesting is that there was an actual public conversation about doing that very thing in the 1990s, because the city knew <laughs> that as people were leaving, they were losing tax revenue. What do we use to, for, with our tax revenue? We use our tax revenue to pay for the snow to be removed, the trash to picked up, all of our utilities. And so when you don't have enough money to pay for those things, what happens? Your services aren't that good. And people start to make choices to go other places. And so it was already foreseen that it was being unsustainable financially to afford the way the city was not moving forward, basically. And then even up into this mayor, uh, and, and right as his administration was starting, um, his big launch uh, initially was Bing 3000, <laughs> where by the end of his term, he was going to demolish 10,000 of the city's vacant property by the end of his first term. And this was viewed as real progress and success in moving the city forward. If we can just get rid of the blight, if we could just get rid of the buildings that don't look great, <coughs> That would pave the way for a new Detroit. <laughs> what I'm trying to sort of represent here is that as early as the 1940s, um, there have been these plans to manage uh, what has been an unstable environment, and not a lot of plans to envision, well, what can the city become? <laughs> So by 2010, we're starting to see all kinds of news stories. Uh, one very infamous one, I remember the day very clearly, uh, where uh, Mayor Bain gave an uh, uh, interview to the Free Press editorial board and said that he was moving everybody to seven or nine neighborhoods. So you can imagine this freaked out our team because that was not quite our advice. We had just started and we were telling people we don't have a plan yet. And then three months later, he tells everybody that this is his plan. So uh, that was not the case. Uh, but the fuel was already on the fire, you know, igniting people's fears about what was going to happen. Where were people going to go? Are you really going to start shutting things down? And how are you going to afford to move me? And I don't want to move. You know, all of these things were afoot. And so it was certainly a time in, in 2010 where people were really not very optimistic about the city's future. Much so that I would turn on my television uh, frequently to hear reports about Detroit's dying, and that it's going to die, 
and it makes no sense to save it. Um, and certainly when these are the only kinds of images that you see in the popular media, you certainly have uh, not a lot of faith that in fact the city that was the birthplace of the American dream and the automobile industry has a fighting chance to come back. Um, we started hearing lots of reports around if you would just take all of this vacant land and turn it into a farm aid. Uh, this would save the day. And I like to tell a story, I gave a TED talk recently, um, and part of what I was trying to communicate there was linking Detroit's future to its past and its people. And if you know a little bit about American history, you know that a lot of African Americans migrated from the rural south um, between 1916 and 1930 to the industrial north, where they were able to find jobs and really with, with little to no education, you know, could really build the American dream. They had steady work, a nine to five job, they could afford a house that they could buy, they could obviously afford a car that they were making, they could send their kids to the neighborhood school, lots of them went to college. You know, this was a huge sacrifice for these men and women who traveled from the south to the north to be a part of this new economy. And I would just like to think that, and in fact, we heard this a lot from residents when we did community meetings, uh, and these were the grandparents, grandchildren and great-grandchildren of these folks who had migrated from the South. You know, their grandfather or grandmother didn't leave the farm for their great-grandkids to farm in the city as their primary means. And so while urban agriculture has been a really phenomenal tool in helping to stabilize so many communities in Detroit, and Detroit is doing some really progressive things around urban agriculture, during this time in 2010, this was the only idea people were talking about as the savior for the city. And so we were really determined, and, and, and it became more than just about land use for us. It became about resident advancement. How are the people in the city also going to move forward with the way with which we wanted the physical city to improve? And certainly, this summer's announcements about bankruptcy has steeped even more fears about the future of the city. But even before this happened, which was in July of this year, civic leaders in the city knew that something fundamentally had to change. And this was, again, starting in 2010. We had just gotten the 2010 census showing that Detroit lost another 24% of its population, and that was uh, the top losing city at the time. Um, we knew that financial crisis was looming. Um, residents knew that they were paying way more than any other municipality in the region for car insurance, for home insurance. Their taxes were higher, and they weren't getting better services. So everyone had reached a point where they were just kind of fed up. And the facts about the fiscal crisis and the facts about the population loss were indisputable. And so people really felt like we just have to do something different. Because in fact, Detroit still had over 700,000 people in the city, and that makes it the 18th largest city in the country. Out of all the cities we have, it's a still a pretty large city. Um, we sit, Detroit does, on the busiest North American border crossing for trade. People don't know that very much. Um, philanthropy has invested close to a half a billion dollars in investment in the city in assets that still exist there. So there is a there there, including the people who are there. How do we build on these to think about transitioning to a new future for the city that doesn't rely on trying to build it back to what it was in 1950, but perhaps take the opportunity to see a new vision for it. And to do that, because obviously, as I said before, it took us about 60 to 70 years to get to where we are. It's going to take us a long time to get to a new future, too. So it was important that we looked at strategies that were about stabilizing and sustaining you know, a regular, a predictable, healthy way of doing things, that we found ways to improve systems, and that we found ways in the long term to really be transformative. So the Detroit Future City Plan, which is actually um, on a website, you can go to the Detroit Works Project, 
or Detroit Future City, if you Google either of those, the entire plan is online, as well as a number of background materials, um, is a comprehensive look at the challenges of Detroit. So it's not just about going in and looking at a physical plan of land use and looking at the zoning. It's not just about an economic development strategy that looks at which sectors we should go after and how do we train people. It's not just looking at sustainability as it relates to water and waste systems. And it's not just looking at the neighborhood scale. It had to look across all of these things because all of these things are so fundamentally connected. And so the framework plan addresses all five of these elements as well as a civic engagement component. And I'm not going to talk about each one in the silo that it's in. I'm going to try to talk about it from the perspective of a couple different propositions we had. I don't know how my slides get all over. I was supposed to talk about Detroit's brand as being really key. Detroit's brand is really key. Um, okay. So I'm going to talk about each of those five elements from the perspective of five provocations. And these five provocations um, really were on the table and being discussed early on in a very kind of speculative way. But I thought that they were really interesting when I first took the job on in 2010. And the first one was kind of, you know, accepting business as usual, which was effectively accepting a dispersed city, as I like to call it, which is things are just scattered wherever they're scattered. There's no connectivity. There's no rhyme or reason. There's no hierarchy. You just kind of let things go as they're going to go. And this is kind of takes us back to the urban sprawl, uh, those images that we saw earlier on, and just looking how the pattern of how development and density that transect across the region. And this is a diagram from one of my students I taught at um, Harvard's Graduate School of Design, and we did a design studio on Detroit. And so he was mapping uh, both spatially how that density pattern sort of sprawls into the city and aligning that with the transect of densities related to residential development. If we look at the, the scale of the city region in this kind of dispersed city, we find it's very uneven and unjust, taking us back to the just city. So this map is showing us about housing vacancy. The lighter the color, the more vacancy there is. And so you can see that vacancy is very concentrated in Detroit and up near Flint. Whereas you can see the opposite as it relates to average income. The lighter the color, the lower the income. So you see how when you stack all these plants on top of each other, these trends overlap and layer onto one another. Um, when we looked at this, this first city in terms of transportation and jobs, we found that of all the jobs that were in Detroit, uh, only 70,000 of those workers live and work in the city. 163,000 of them work, live somewhere else and drive to the city. And then another 116,000 Detroiters have to leave the city for work. So there's a lot of cross-commuting coming on. And what we found is that there are not enough jobs for residents. There are 27 jobs in Detroit for every 100 residents. Um, when we looked at historic density patterns, we found that when you look at the little excerpt on, at the top there, that's the historic density pattern. Um, of housing, houses or people per acre that was generating about $150,000 in taxes. When you look at how that density has changed as people and buildings have left, it's a significant de decrease in revenue, right? So that explains why our city services aren't as good as we expect them to. So the city losing population and the city losing jobs is having a direct impact on what the physical city looks like and how it can be maintained. And so when we take this transect of looking at vacancy, this is another one of my students from that class, we look at what a zero vacancy neighborhood looks like in the streetscape all the way to neighborhoods that have upwards of 75% vacancy and what the streetscape looks like there. Uh, still landscaped and lush, all the buildings around it are gone. This is a new landscape, and a very critical question for us was, were we going to be able to take every area of the city that once looked like the image on the left and bring it back to the image on the right? And in the end, our answer was no. And I'll show you some examples of, of what we proposed as alternates. Um, I've never been in Detroit when there was a traffic jam. 
and I've been on the road at all times of the day and night. There are extraordinarily beautiful wide boulevards uh, planned as a part of the original city um, that are in excess of roadways and asphalt and surface water. Um, and how do we look at the utilization of roads and whether or not it makes sense to maintain them at these scales? How do we look at our water systems, which are operating at 40% of their, their total capacity? How do we transform those systems to be more efficient for what is the reality of what Detroit is today, making a real definitive decision that it's never going to be a city of 1.8 million people, let's say in the next 100 years. So a second um, proposition was the repopulated city. So a lot of times cities like Detroit, and Detroit is on the larger scale of legacy cities, the typical size would be like your Flint's and your Cleveland's and your St. Louis's and your Gary's. But the, the, the knee-jerk reaction is, is to repopulate it. What we need is more residents. If we get the residents back, that will help with our economic creation. So if we build it, they will come. Now, this required us to have a real keen understanding on who was actually in the city and who we were doing this planning for. And so we needed to understand who was leaving. So families with children typically leave cities that are declining because of access to amenities and health uh, care and education. Uh, couples were leaving, young couples or old couples, <laughs> thinking about starting a family and thinking about school, um, and single family fair. So a lot of people leaving is very much tinged on school-aged children. Uh, and that's a big generalization, uh, but I'll put it out there. Um, skilled workers are also leaving too as jobs are leaving the city. <laughs> Who's staying? Seniors are staying, perhaps seniors who are on fixed incomes who don't have much choice about where to go. Um, young professionals are finding Detroit cool and affordable and interesting and entrepreneurial, and so they're kind of staying and coming. Uh, college students actually aren't staying as much as we like them to. Michigan, the state of Michigan, and there's a, a statistic that shows that most of you in this room will not stay in Michigan after you graduate that you'll go and find jobs in other places. Um, you don't have to raise your hand to admit that today. Hopefully by the time you graduate, there are, might be some compelling and interesting prospects for you. Um, and also who's staying are what we call our vulnerable populations, people who um, economically are very limited in their choices of where they live. Um, and then who's arriving? Uh, there's actually a wave of foreign-born populations moving into the city young professionals, as I said again, and coupled with that are college students. So who's coming, staying, um, and leaving is really important. Good trends, though. Uh, CEOs for Cities, which is a really interesting organization, um, and, and many organizations like this last year talked a lot about uh, how young folks are moving to cities. Now, this has been a trend that's been happening for some time now, and perhaps many of you are interested and ready to move to a city larger, perhaps, than your hometown, um, because it offers everything you want. Jobs, access to amenities, affordability, like-minded colleagues, etc. Detroit has the potential to capitalize on this. As I said, foreign-born populations are really fueling the small increases in population loss in Detroit, and these are some of the areas where they're headed. <clears throat> the downtown midtown of Detroit is where those young folks are going. This is the hub of this region's uh, education institutions and medical institutions and cultural institutions in terms of an aggregate. I know I'm sitting on a very large campus here, um, but combining all of those things together, uh, Detroit still has the um, need. And so the other thing that is going to fuel the repopulation, it's not just people living in the city, but as I said before, people working in the city. So remember I said that there are 27 jobs for every 100 residents in the city. We compared that to other cities that are about the same size at 139 square miles and about the same population with the exception of Philadelphia, which is slightly larger. And guess what? They have more jobs than people. And guess what? They're doing better than Detroit. So this is Philadelphia. This is Atlanta. This is Portland. This is Denver. So ironically, when we kind of looked at it in terms of economic health, vis-a-vis -vis jobs, size didn't matter in terms of the geography of the city. And people saying the city was just too big, 
you should change the boundaries of the city, etc. Not so much. It was really about the fact that you need more jobs in the city where Detroiters are working that helps to fuel a more stable uh, economy. So we mapped all of what we call the economic assets in the city, the big firms, be the public sector or private sector or institutional, and we found that there were some pretty big employers all over the city. We looked at where our infrastructure was. Some of the infrastructure can't be uh, replaced anywhere else, like the port of Detroit. And we found that there wasn't just one kind of downtown for jobs, that there were seven viable employment districts in the city. So here we found that the repopulated city wasn't just about people, even though that's really important too in terms of residents. It's much more important that we try to figure out how to bring jobs, not just to the region, but to the city specifically, so they can be better connected to all of those Detroiters who have to travel outside of the city for work. The third proposition is around the consolidated city. Lots of uh, media folks like this, and uh, I think uh, prominent uh, urbanists and urban designers with fashion, well, if you just consolidate everything down to these nice, neat urban villages, everything would just work out fine. So you remember the map of all the vacancy. It was like all over the place. I mean, how are you going to shrink that down to something that makes sense? Because within those dots are some pretty wealthy neighborhoods, and within other dots are poor neighborhoods. It's very, very indiscriminate. And so this consolidation notion, or what Saarinen called this organic decentralization, was still an interesting idea, though. But how do we do it differently than we've done before? So we did a lot of evaluation of what was happening on the ground, a lot of it based in just looking at the physical condition. Uh, there was a huge survey, a windshield survey that they called, and someone literally drove around and tried to capture and inventory the status of all the residential property in Detroit. It took over a year and a half to complete. We looked at the market values of the property. We looked at the demographics of income and race and educational attainment and population densities. We looked at where investment was happening. And from that, we came up with what we call this 